Welcome to Screw the Commute, the entrepreneurial podcast dedicated to getting you out of the car and into the money with your host, lifelong entrepreneur and multimillionaire, Tom Antion. Hey, everybody. It's you, Jackman, here with episode 709 of Screw the Commute podcast. And you got to be irresistible like you, Jackman, to get a guy a famous guy like Tom Poland to come on this show. I got to tell you. <laughs> all right. So, so folks, all right. No, it's not really you, Jackman. It's fat old Tom, your old buddy here. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, we got, uh, he's going to, we'll tell you what that means in uh, a little bit later about the you Jackman thing. But, but, uh, like this guy, we got a lot in common. Uh, he's got this pay me later idea that I've been doing for, with a kind of a variation for 25 years. So I really like uh, the way he, uh, he handles things. So we'll bring him on in a minute. Hope you didn't miss episode 708. That was low content books. And again, this is kind of funny for me to be talking about low content books when I'm known for high content books. <laughs> I had one for 10 years that was 1,042 pages. So that's, I don't think that counts as low content. But, but my friend uh, Cindy Cashman is the one that 26 years ago wrote the book, uh, What Men Know About Women. And it was totally blank. And she sold millions of them. She was like a, a, a semi-literate, uh, single mom, broke. <laughs> and she, she turned it all around, sold millions of books, and then sold the company for millions. I love her. All right, make sure you follow me on TikTok at tiktok.com at digital multimillionaire. And also pick up a copy of our automation ebook at screwthecommute.com slash automate free. And you will thank me for it because... <laughs> It's uh, we we actually estimated what just one of the tips in the book we estimated saved me eight million keystrokes. See, I want you working with customers and clients and develop uh, products and services, not fighting with your computer. So grab a copy of that that book. All right, let's get to the main event here. Tom Poland is here. He's a multiple best-selling author specializing in the generation of high-quality leads for professionals in 151 cities around the world. And he's uh, started and sold numerous businesses over the last 39 years and has led teams of over 100 people, generating more than $20 million in revenue. And he, he lives and works from his home on the sunshine coast of Australia, complete with his much-loved wife, dog, tennis courts, swimming pool, and private rainforest. And I got all of that except for the wife and the rainforest. So, so Tom, are you ready to screw the commute. Ready to rock and roll, Tom. We can call ourselves the the drummers or something, you know, Tom Tom drums. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Any, well, see, uh, anybody that's uh, named Tom has got to be a good guy. So, so we're glad to have you on. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, listen. That, that's 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 probably my best qualification for being on your show, right? <laughs> exactly. So uh, we'll get to you, Jackman, in a, in a little while, but but. Um, this lead generation stuff, uh, tell us how you got started in that. Well, it, it's actually an interesting story because I used to have a completely different product, which was a, a basically kind of like an MBA for entrepreneurs because there was a big gap in the market back in the day. When I launched that, it was 1995, so a couple of years ago. But what happened is we were really very successful. You know, We went from a, a zero to a seven-figure business pretty quickly and went international. So there was a demand in the marketplace. But the funny thing is, you know, so many of our new clients weren't asking me about what's coming up in the program, but they're asking me, how the heck do you do your marketing? Wait a minute, wait and a minute. Who's, so, who's we and our? Who, who are we talking about here? You and your wife, or is this me. when you were in another business? No, me. Okay. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's, the, it's the royal we. Okay. It's, 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 it's the way you pretend to have less ego. Oh, I get it. You, 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 you share the glory. <laughs> but um, no, it was, well, I, I started the thing in 95. No, no, it, it was just, primarily my business i mean i had a team of people working there mm -hmm. um but my wife wasn't one of them certainly not at the time she came in later on so um where to get to yeah so so i had so many people asking about the marketing how we were packing out you know conference rooms and and workshop halls and so on and so on and when i finished with that business which was around 2008 i think i was sitting around twiddling my thumbs i'd, I'd moved on and thinking about the next business and 
I thought, well, why don't I do something on lead generation? Since that seemed to be the number one question that we got. And I went online and I had a look at surveys and survey after survey after survey for small business owners said that it, it consistently ranked in the top three and often number one spot was what's your greatest need? And it was new client flows. It was new client flows. So I decided I would kick off my next business, uh, A, on lead generation and B, online because I would had enough of traveling and flying and hotels and so on. So since 2008, I've been 99% online, just using webinars and online courses and Zoom calls and web, go to webinar. And it's all been about marketing, new yeah. generation. And speaking of webinars, yeah, I've done hundreds of webinars, made millions of dollars with them. I, I love that. You're kind of preaching to the choir there. But tell, tell everybody why you like uh, webinars. And I know you have done hundreds of in-person events, uh, as have I, Yeah, where... It's a hassle. I mean, well, I only, I never liked the logistics and I think you uh, are in that uh, place too, but the enormous yeah, amounts of risk and money and, and flying and all the crap that right. goes along with it. The, um, so if you, if you look at marketing results, there's, you, you can get them and you can get new clients in a whole lot of different ways, but you can summarize two characteristics of any marketing system or lead generation system, one being efficiency and the other being effectiveness. And to actually evaluate a marketing system, you have to take into account both the efficiency and the effectiveness. For example, um, I can run a big event in New York and I can do direct mail marketing. I do advertising. I can have a steam of people there to register people at the, in the foyer of the hotel I can get the audio visual system set up. We can have a spectacular light display. We can have smoke going, you know, and and and, well, and I can walk on the stage and chainsaw my way out of a wooden box and, you know, razzle dazzle. And, and we would get a lot of clients. There's no doubt about that. So that's a very, very effective, probably nine out of 10 or 10 out of 10 for effective way to market, but it's not efficient. Yeah, and but you, you the left out, the scale, wait a minute, Tom, you left out the fact that you could get free heroin needles. You know, just by having an event in New York. <laughs> Hell, just the needles. Yeah, um, yes, that's right. So, and then, and you can look at something else like, um, I don't know, you you could do something that's really easy to do, set up, a, post an article to LinkedIn. Very efficient, but highly ineffective. And, and the French have a word for this, and I can't quite remember, something like efficace or something, but they... They have a word that combines both efficiency and effectiveness in one word. Yeah, it's effed, and effed up, I think. That's what, that's, <laughs> that's what webinars give you. They give you the best of the efficiency and the effectiveness. If you, if you were able to subjectively give a score for effectiveness, it would, webinars would be less than a live event. But if you gave a score for efficiency, it would be 10 times a live event. Mm -hmm. So you combine, if you, if, so for my mind, if you want lifestyle and you want pretty good results as well, then online meetings trump uh, the offline meetings. There's still a place for the offline meetings. I always had new clients start start with the online stuff because it's more efficient. It'll get you going quicker. It's 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 much much easier. It's almost almost free to do, and get some runs on the board. And then if you want to do venture into the world of more complicated, more expensive, but more effective meetings, then sure you can run some physical meetings. But do that a little later. Why do low lying fruit on the tree first rather than getting a letter out and risking going to the top of the tree yeah no if there was one silver lining of the pandemic is i mean i've been preaching and i've never had a job so i've been in my own business 47 47 years and so so uh, i've been preaching wow. working from home working from home screw the commute and uh the pandemic woke people up and said oh you can work from home i didn't know that <laughs> so so yeah, yeah exactly yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I haven't been on a plane in three years and i am thrilled to death about it <laughs> so yeah and that's interesting and so the paradigm shift the the way of looking at marketing meetings changed completely with with the with the pandemic um because you and i were sitting there doing our stuff beforehand and other people were going some other people were going no you can't yeah, it wouldn't work in my business and all of a sudden <laughs> guess what they made it work. Right. So that's 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 a liberating breakthrough for a lot of people. Uh, and and as I said, there's still a place for the physical online events. But you know, you and I have been around long enough, and we've done enough of them to go. Eh, 
I don't think I don't think I want to leave home quite as much as I used to. Yeah, I mean, I'll I'll go if somebody else sets up all the deal and makes a lot of people because I'll come home with a massive amount of money because they got my act down. But but the thing is, is yeah. like I said, I love sitting here. And now I, uh, uh, you have a book on this. I read about three quarters of it today. And um, wow. Yeah, because, you know, I'm a continuous learner and you get one little tip uh, can change the whole course of somebody's business. You know, if you get that attitude, Mm. anybody thinks they know know it all that they're on their way downhill in a hurry. Uh, But uh, one of the ways you talked, well, several of the ways, I mean, you covered uh, getting attendees and uh, some of them were paid advertising and 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 uh, I don't think you gave uh, great credence to that because. It's really complicated to do it well and turn it into uh, profitability. So uh, what are some of the ways right. you're, you're putting people in your webinars? So so 90% of our attendees come through what I call OPN, mm-hmm. and people will have heard of o- probably OPM, uh, other people's money. You know, you, you borrow other people's money and you invest in property and you get the leverage and so on. OPT is another one, other people's time. So you hire people, employees, freelancers, franchisees, licensees, and, and you can leverage your results of other people's time. But OPN, and for Nigel, is other people's networks. And we did, uh, you know, we ran Facebook ads for, for many years, I think between about 2008 and maybe 2000, and, I'm going to say 2001, something like that. But we did we crashed the numbers and we we discovered, to my horror, I should say, that Someone who registered for a webinar, which is our main marketing vehicle uh, for for reasons we've already discussed, but someone who registered for a webinar from a Facebook ad versus someone who registered for a webinar from someone else's email list, more specifically, OPN, is the latter was 50 times more likely to become a client than the former. Mm -hmm. So someone's on Facebook and they go, oh, there's an ad for a webinar. Well, that could be interesting. Whatever, I'll click. They're a wanderer, and what I call a wanderer. They're kind of wandering through Facebook, checking up with friends, family, et cetera, having a laugh, putting something on Marketplace or whatever, and they see an ad out of the corner of their eye. They've just been wandering through, and it catches, kind of catches their attention, but they don't have serious intent because they never went to the network we call Facebook uh, with an intent to solve a problem or pursue uh, uh, their potential. Yeah, and you paid for that terrible lead, by the way. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, yeah, and that's that's the other thing. And and I I closed my Facebook account down when I got a bill from Mark Zuckerberg for I don't know three thousand three hundred dollars or whatever it was. Mm-hmm. You know, logged into my Facebook account and saw that so the monthly fee was due, and it's fine. We, you know, you 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 hire the pipe. You got to you got to pay for the tune. I closed it down on that day because we because on exactly the same in the same almost the same breath, I opened our OPN tracker and I saw eight hundred and sixty nine webinar registrants from one of our marketing partners or OPN partners and that didn't cost me a cent and so here I was paying Zuckerberg and Facebook as it was back then now meta thousands of dollars every month for what was becoming poorer and poorer quality leads when I could get them completely free and I could rinse and repeat without cost the audiences that I was generating month after month after month through other people's networks yeah, and I think I heard you say uh, uh, you were advertising between 2001 and 2008. Uh, I think that's what I heard you say, but um, it probably yeah, two, two, 2000. Had, yeah, you probably had a hard time yeah, converting yeah. between 2001 and 2004 because Facebook didn't start till 2004. So. Yeah, no, I, I, well, perhaps I misspoke. I, I yeah. meant to say 2008. Sorry, 2008. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, 2008 but, to about 2011, 2012, and it yeah. keeps it keeps getting more complicated, and more uh, and prices going up, and they can uh, and if you don't really know what you're doing, you know they they can tell just by the way you advertise, and then they uh, they just take your money basically. So it's uh, well, uh, you got to think of Facebook advertising like. Um, like a Roman amphitheater where the gladiators are fighting. And if you're an advertiser, you're, you're one of the gladiators trying to kill the other competitors. And the king, you know, the emperor is sitting there in his chair. That's Mark. Right. <laughs> and, 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 and it gets even worse because you're actually paying for the privilege to fight and kill the other advertisers. It's, it's called cost per click. And you bid on the opportunity for, you know, you, you pay money for the opportunity to to pay more money than your competitors to Mark Zuckerberg and his team. 
Um, so this is the best possible marketing model from Meta or Facebook or Zuckerberg's point of view. It's the worst possible <laughs> marketing model from your point of view and my point of view because you, you, you're just slugging it out with other competitors and, and paying for the privilege to, to put them. Whereas with OPN, there are very few competitors. Yeah, and I'm, I, you know, I wrote a book on joint ventures, so I'm totally in your in your field on that. But I'm wondering, uh, uh, you know, I've been uh, espousing that one of the best bargains of advertising is YouTube in stream ads. These are the ones where you can click the skip button. Have you uh, used any of those to try to drive um, webinar attendees? No, 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 we haven't. Um, and we, we we certainly continue to explore other revenue uh, marketing mm -hmm. sources and lead generation sources. So I've made a note of that. Thank you. Yeah. And the, the reason is because yeah. uh, you can get enormous branding there. Of course, you are interrupting them. They weren't there looking for you. They were looking for the other guy. Uh, but uh, yeah. you don't pay anything if they uh, if they don't if they click away within 30 seconds. So you can get if you uh, front load your uh, message, uh, and then I, we even in some cases tell them, "Hey, if you're not interested in this, click right here. <laughs> Just uh, go click before right. 30 seconds, yeah. and you get the branding, yeah. but not uh, you don't have to pay anything." So so anyway, now um, yeah. to get people to uh, sign up, uh, one of the most critical things uh, that you say, and I believe, is the title. Uh, what are some of the tips on yeah. titling your webinars? Right. So th there's there's a blend of psychology and, and marketing essentially is psychology because what we're doing is we're wanting to influence people. So we have to deal with the realities of how the brain works. And or if the, it works at all any, people, anymore nowadays. Well, yeah, hope, hopefully. <laughs> well, you, the ones that don't work so well, you probably don't want them as clients. But <laughs> um, so, so in the brain, there's this thing called the reticular activating system. Folks will have heard of it. They might have heard of the reptilian brain. There's lots of different ways to describe it, but it's it's a it's a physical area of the brain called the RAS or reticular activating system, and it's designed to filter out irrelevance and filter in relevance. And relevance is to I have a problem, I need to solve it, or I have potential I'd like to fulfill. So any title has to get cut through. And specifically, it has to cut through and get through the RAS, the reticular activating system. And this is why, you know, probably most people know you have to have a benefit in the title. But it's no longer enough to have a benefit in the title. The benefit has to be expressed in a manner which is differentiated. So to get through to uh, get through the reticular activating system and for your your title to hit the amygdala in the brain, which is the the center for deciding whether you fight or whether you flight or whether you find find out more, then your title has to have three characteristics. Yes, it does have to be benefit rich, but two, it has to be differentiated from the words that your prospects, your target market have heard in the past. Because if you just say, hey, I'll come to a webinar, I'll show you how to grow your business, that doesn't get through the reticular activating system because they've heard, and they've heard double your business in 90 days. They've heard that so many times and they've heard all the BS and they've heard all the hype. So all that's stuff gets filtered out by the reticular activating system and it doesn't even get to the amygdala and I, I can give you a classic example of how the the reticular activating system works let's say you you buy a new car and it's a red i don't know red ford fiesta and you you discover this car because a friend bought one and and you're driving back from the dealership very proud that you've made a wise purchase and suddenly every freaking second car on the road seems to be a ford fiesta mm -hmm. and every tenth one is a red one and you'd never noticed that before. You say, how come everyone's got a Ford Fiesta all of a sudden? Or you, you know, you 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 have a child and you name it a certain name and you think it's really unique, and then you take them to play school a couple of years later, and every second freaking child has got the same name. <laughs> it's not that there's suddenly this proliferation of the cars or the children with that name. It's that your reticular activating system is going, I know this is important to us, so I'm gonna let it through to the amygdala because of relevance. So your title's got to be benefit rich. It's got to contain, it's got to be differentiated. And you can do that through including specifics. Let me give you an example. So here's a client does a software for fast food restaurants like McDonald's, Burger King, et cetera. And his title for his event, as it was back then, since webinars, was we create great point of sale software for quick service restaurants. Come and see how we do that. We're going to do a demonstration of our software. Great point of sale software. So, you know, you're at the checkout counter of McDonald's and they go, would you like fries? Or, or you know, that's prompted 
by the software and the upsells are all prompted and they benchmark one salesperson against another and they can generate more sales. So we create great, first of all, the owners of fast food franchises don't care if you create great software because they've already got software. So if someone reads that title, come along to our demonstration of how we create great point of sale software. The Retic Direct Everything system goes, been there, done that, not relevant to the problem we're trying to solve or the potential we want to fulfill. So we changed it so that it became not product centric, but benefit centric. And we differentiated it and we included the specifics. They're the three characteristics we need in a title. So the title then read, demonstration, how we're increasing the sales and profits of quick service restaurants, QSRs is the acronym, by 25% within 90 days, guaranteed. Now, that gets cut through. No one had heard, point of, and by the way, no mention of point of sale software, right? Mm -hmm. It's just how we increase the sales and profits in quick service restaurants by 25% in 90 days, guaranteed. We can demonstration how you do that. So that turned it from a title that failed to get cut through and failed to hit the amygdala and activate the find out more response into an event where people were, were filling the seats. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, it's thought uh, well thought out. And and I got to tell you, every time I go to, <laughs> to one of these places, sometimes the uh, abbreviation or acronym POS shows up on the screen and pos also stands for piece of shit <laughs> so i think that's the, the way they're thinking of me as a customer <laughs> yeah, I, I, <laughs> so I'm, should, I'm inspired by your creative thinking well Tom. pass it on to the people they should change the acronyms <laughs> now uh, yeah but now, creative people like you would think of something else that stands for probably <laughs> now uh I was, uh, when I read that you have this, uh, quote, contrarian view of the purpose of email, I was really intrigued mm -hmm. because everybody that listens to this show knows that I've made a fortune on email. All the social, the only people that dispute that the money is in the email are the people selling social media training. All right, but social Correct. media to me Correct. is a uh, necessary evil to get them off of there onto an email list. And I, I was real interested in this thing that you have, this algorithm killer, whatever it is, that uh, can tell yeah. if a if a if a, if a, a potential joint venture or OPN partner is a POS or yeah. not. <laughs> I had to throw right. that in there. Um, so. So email. So, but I didn't. I was reading a book. I didn't see any con, uh, thing that I didn't agree with. What's the contrarian part? Well, you're done marketing for what forty something years. So well, you've, you've figured this stuff out probably know, online since the commercial internet started. Yeah. yeah. So you've yeah. probably figured this stuff out a long time <laughs> before. So you, your mind it may not be contrarian, but a lot of people. Let me let me just touch on the the purpose of an email list, which mm -hmm. is for many people would would be contrarian. So most people think that they need to grow an email list so that they can, you know, offer their stuff to it, right? Right. That's that traditional right. thinking. I need more email subscribers so I can market my stuff to them and they'll buy stuff and I'll, I'll get more clients. So what I what I discovered is there's a far more profitable um, objective with an email list. So how often could I market my stuff to my my email list before I start? To, they start to get annoyed with me? Probably about once every 90 days. Sachi and Sachi did. 20 years of research on this, and they, they think it's every 90 days, that you should be putting an offer. If you do it more than that, people get start get annoyed. They drop off. If you do it less than that, they forget about you. So that gives me probably a, a, to optimize the response from my email list, I've, I've got four shots of it. And lots of people will disagree with that. I, I accept they disagree with that, and that's, that's beside the point. I think you can probably do it more often than that, but that's a safe bet. So if I use my email list to market my stuff to it, there's one email list I'm marketing my stuff to, irrespective of whether it's every week or every 90 days. It's just still one email list. If, however, I view my email list as an opportunity to market other people's carefully curated, high quality, but free content to, in exchange for them promoting my high quality content to their email list, suddenly, I mean, I can do that at least once a week. So suddenly I'm getting my stuff marketed to 50 other email lists every year instead of how many? One. Mm -hmm. And that's the contrary, contrary in view, if you like, is I urge people to think of their growing their email list as, yes, being 
an economic imperative, but to do so with the objective of opening up to other people's email lists so that you can have a multiplier effect of 50 times. And by the way, you can still email your offer, whatever that is, your webinar or your five-day challenge or your free book or whatever it is, to your email list every 90 days. That's no problem. You can get no list out doing that from that. But so you still got that opportunity, but now you've got 50 other email addresses being opened up promoting your stuff to. Yeah. And, and just, uh, you know, like my uh, book didn't really concentrate on that. My book concentrated on um, the fact that if you know how to approach a large list owner, uh, you could have zero as long as you approach them properly. And most people don't, you know, I have to tell them to take a hike because I get 20 people a week trying to get me to promote their stuff. So, so it's different <laughs> than what you, you're doing. Uh, you're, you're, uh, you know, trade, you know, swapping basically. Uh, and uh, mine, uh, and, and I totally believe in that. Absolutely. It's harder to swap though, when I, you know, I've got a hundred thousand and people have, you know, 50, yeah. <laughs> you know, so, so I don't do as many yeah, swaps. So yeah, no, hundred percent. I, I get that totally. So for for a lot of people listening to this, they've either got a, a no email list or a very small email list, and the question in their mind maybe, well, well, I don't have anything to swap with. How do how do I get started? And look, I, I folks, I walked out of a you know a, a, well on sold and started a new business, and I think it was two thousand and eight. You know, the years blur, but that's anyhow. Whenever it was seven or eight, um, I started with an email list of eight people. Uh, we grew it to currently around 27,000. We grew it a lot larger than that, but we culled it back. So the important thing is to start, and you start with people who have small email lists. That's where you do your swaps with people. Other people have got mm -hmm. eight subscribers. But yep. how you grow your email list is not just from the few webinar registrants or downloads you get for your free book or your, you, know, you need something right to offer in terms of free content. Otherwise, you fall into the trap of huge Ackman marketing, which we can come yeah, back to. Yeah, we're going to get to that. <laughs> um, so, so you need something as um, to give folks the, the opportunity to dip their toe in the water with your brand before you make the offer of, of becoming a client or talking about becoming a client. So that said, you've got something developed, assuming you've, you've got a free content piece and you start doing cross promotions, OPN swaps, if you like, with people who have small emailers. So you get some subscribers that way, a few a trickle of subscribers. But you do what 99% of people in the JV market, joint venture market, don't do, which is you put into place a quality control piece after you've done the swap. So that's a Zoom call meeting where you meet with the person who promoted your stuff and you promoted their stuff and you say to them, was it good for you? Uh, and if it wasn't good for them, you make up for it somehow, but you have that person walking away wanting to do the same thing in a year's time when they have grown their email list a bit more and you've grown your email list a bit more. But at that point, you can refer that individual to three other people that you know who might want to do a swap and just do your Google research and reach out to people and get Tom's book and figure out how to do this stuff. The other Tom, I mean. But the debrief meeting, the other partner will refer you to three of their contacts. Now, if you're doing this once a week, uh, you'll have three of these meetings a month because one will drop out or won't show up or whatever. That's just, you know, 25% don't turn up. So that's still three people you're doing debriefs meeting with, you're doing swaps with, you're doing debriefs meetings with. And so that's nine referrals. Again, take three of them out because they won't fire. That's still six more people that you're getting referred to to do swaps with every single month. So you, this is this is the only marketing system I know of that is self-feeding its growth. You just do the swaps, low numbers to start with, but of the three that you get referred to from each partner, one will have a larger list than your partner on average. One will have about the same size list and one will have a smaller list. So every month you're working your way up the email food chain. You're getting a larger list and you're getting referred to people with larger lists and you're doing the debrief if you're making sure everyone's happy. And the number one thing that mature marketers are concerned about when you do a swap with them is that their subscribers come back and thank them for the introduction to your content. So the number one thing I look for is not the email list size, that's important, but it's the quality of the content that I'm going to be introducing my subscribers to because I want my subscribers to be really happy with the introductions. So don't get hung up on the size of your email list. What I'm saying is we were all born naked. None of us came out with an email list. 
you've got to start somewhere. Everyone starts somewhere. So start, but make sure that as you grow your list, the quality of your content is world-class because that's what's going to open the doors to OPM. So there you heard it, folks. Uh, folks. The, the famous Tom Poland said that size does not matter. This is the age of my wife. Question. My <laughs> wife disagrees, but I'm sticking to that. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, so that's a, a way that I haven't really been doing uh, for years and years, but it's a very, very solid way to grow your list. What I've been promoting is, uh, is you have to have an affiliate program to do the uh, the one that I promote, and then go for much bigger fish. So you could do both. There's no nothing stopping you. So, yeah, but do exactly. something. That's do good something. Point. Good point. Good <laughs> All right. point. And and that. That and that's the affiliate program that you just mentioned, Tom, is something I I should have mentioned. But it is a great equalization strategy if you're starting with a small list and you want to tap into someone's larger list. You can offer them an affiliate uh, commission, uh, or you can offer to promote their free thing with three emails and only promote one to yours. So there are ways you can tap into larger lists, even if you've got a smaller list. But the the underlying thing is you've got to have good quality content. Absolutely. And uh, you have to know what to say if you're going for the big fish. All right. So tell them about the, the Hugh Jackman story. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, in, I'm in my kitchen and my wife and I are having a coffee. And I don't know where, where it came from. I had some sort of brain sneeze. And, and I said to her, you know, I mean, I'm like 65 years old and wrinkled, right? So I'm not exactly the greatest catch in the world. But uh, for some reason, I said to my wife, who is exceptionally pretty, I said, who, who would you say is the world's most irresistible man? And she fluffed around with George Clooney and Roger Federer. And then, that I, then and, but I wasn't convinced because I didn't see her eyes light up. And then she goes, she puts a copy down. She goes, oh, I know. And her eyes go wide open. And she goes, Hugh Jackman, that, you know, that Australian dude who's got the six pack and, you know, he's he's got a body Adonis would die for. He's a philanthropist. He's community minded. He's charitable. He's uh, he's got a private jet. He's got houses in Monaco and, you know, New York and the Bahamas. And, and he, he is the world's most complete human being. She said, I would rate Hugh Jackman as the world's most irresistible man. So I thought, yeah, I, I, I get that. I can see your face is all lit up. And then I said to him, let's just say there was a knock at the front door right now and you put your coffee down this is me asking my wife and you went to the front door and it was Hugh Jackman and he even had a shirt off you know and he <laughs> and he dropped to one knee and he and he and he looked up at you and held a small red velvet box up and and flipped the lid and there was a million dollar diamond ring and he said look you don't know me I know but but my name's Hugh Jackman would you make me the happiest man on earth would you run away with me right now and marry me and we'll we'll fly to the Bahamas in my private jet and we'll make my love on the beach under this under the moonlight <laughs> What would you say to Hugh Jackman if you proposed to you right now? And my wife flutters her eyelids and, and she has a copy down and she says to me, well, she's Tom, you know, I love you, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking, yeah, and I know what's coming next. She said, well, I'm sorry you asked, but it's Hugh freaking Jackman. I'd run away with the guy, <laughs> you know, to be honest. And um, so I wiped, I wiped a tear out of the corner of my eye and I thought, well, that was a pretty stupid question. I probably deserved that answer. And I, and I said to her, Look, I don't think you need to apologize. She said, what? I just told you I'd run away with another man. I said, yeah, but look, it's Hugh Jackman. If, and honestly, if there was a knock at the front door right now, and it was me, Tom, and I went to the front door and opened it, and it was Hugh Jackman, and he dropped to one knee and held up, and, and he proposed to me, hell, I'd run away, and I'm not even gay. <laughs> I mean, it's Hugh freaking Jackman. Um, you know, and I'd just fake it until you make it or something. But, but the... the the moral of the story is that a lot of people do their marketing a lot like they're the commercial equivalent of Hugh Jackman. It's you meet someone at a business networking meeting and you hand out a business card and you go, "Would you do you need SEO services today?" And it's just too soon. You, it's 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 like proposing marriage at first sight. And you know, there's probably only Hugh Jackman and George Clooney can get away with that. The rest of us poor saps have to ask people out on a date first. You know, to to understand that okay, we are three out of ten physically, but you know, maybe we could be a nine out of 10 fun wise. So maybe that's going to spin you. So what we need to do when we're marketing services, particularly consultancy services, coaching services, training uh, software as a service, we are effectively, it's far more like we're proposing marriage than it is, you know, selling a hot dog or a washing machine. Um, people are buying into a relationship with you. So you need to get them on a first date before you propose anything 
before you propose meeting to talk about their business needs, before party about their personal needs, whatever it is you're selling, give them a first date. And the perfect first date is the webinar because it's low skin in the game. They can disappear out of the room anytime they want. No one knows if they don't like, you know, your body odor or whatever, digitally speaking. And, 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 but it's enough time with you. It's, it's like, it's like dinner out on the town, right? It's, you know, they're not committing to a proposal or marriage and you're not going to even, you know, but, but it's just enough time for them to get to know you. And that's, that's what I love about the webinar. It's, it's, it's like a first date. And at the end of the webinar, that's when you pull out the ring. That's when you say, hey, look, if you have an interest in taking this any further, there's the link, go ahead and buy, or there's the link, go ahead and book a time. And we'll, 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 have, a, we'll have a chat about your needs and see if I can help. You know, it would be funny if, if, you know, I know you've told this story lots of times. If somebody listening, you know, tags you, Jackman, and he shows up at your door. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, mate, I'd still go. <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends on who answered the door. I guess. Yeah, well, well, one of the one population of, of the house would go down by 50% either way. <laughs> so uh, we got to take a brief sponsor break. When we come back, we'll ask uh, Tom what's a typical day look like for him in and, and, uh, and his uh, screw the commute world. So folks, uh, about, uh, about 25 years ago, I kind of turned the internet guru marketing world on its head and that people at my level were charging 50 or 100 grand up front to um, help them with their small business and online marketing stuff. And I, and I knew a lot of these people. They'd be hiding out in Tasmania if you if you gave them 50 grand up front and, and they'd never see them again. Yeah. So uh, yeah. so I said, you know, that's too risky. Uh, I'm going to turn this uh, on its head. It's a little bit different than what uh, Tom has done. Uh, but I said, I'm just going to charge an entry fee. It was about 10 times lower so I tied my success to their success, and for me to get my fifty thousand, they have to net two hundred thousand. Well, people like this, and eighteen hundred students later, it's still going strong. It's the longest running, most successful, most uh, uh, unique mentor and in internet digital marketing program ever. And I always put, <laughs> I, I triple dog dare people for years to put theirs up against mine and nobody will because they'd be embarrassed. I mean, you get an immersion weekend where you actually live in the house with me in the in this estate home in Virginia Beach. We have a TV studio. We shoot your marketing videos. Um, you get a scholarship to my school, which is the only licensed, dedicated internet and digital marketing school in the USA, probably the world. And... Uh, it's all one on one. There's no group stuff here. Uh, I, I group is great for some people, but for me, I, you know, I I, I have to dummy stuff down uh, so that uh, if you're, you're advanced and uh, and I'm talking to a beginner, you're bored. If if you're a beginner and I'm talking advanced, you're lost. So it's all one on one with me and my entire staff. So so if you're interested in something that that kind of uh, hand holding, like I said, it's the longest running ever in this field. So check it out at greatinternetmarketingtraining.com. All right, let's get back to the main event. We've got Tom Poland here. He's one of the luminaries uh, from uh, uh, for our friends from Down Under. And uh, so, Tom, what's a typical day look like for you? Um, well, I start Tuesday morning, and I, <laughs> I work a three-day week. Uh, so that's the first thing I think that's, that's nice. important. To be, yeah, that's nice. And so a typical day for me is uh, I have – Maybe uh, a team meeting with with one of our you know groups, uh, marketing team or the uh, production team or operations team. So I'd have probably I guess average one of those per day out of over the three days. Um, I don't do any direct client work unless it's by special request. Every single client we have, uh, regardless of what price point they come in to, has my mobile phone number in case they need me. Mm -hmm. But um, you know I get maybe one call or message on that a year because we have a, a good support team in place. So it could be the support team I meet with. I do interviews. I do maybe two or three interviews a week. Uh, so that's sort of meeting. And most of my time is development. So I like thinking about the marketing and like to switch that up. I like to develop products. So they are the biggest things that occupy my days. So I'd say over three days, uh, they're the 10 hour days, but over, uh, you know, in any given 10 hour block, therefore, is probably about three hours of meetings or one description or other. And the balance of the time is me thinking and developing it. And, and plotting. Well, what do you do and, the other four yeah. days? 
Um, well, it's like, do you get up? Like, a, give uh, us more of the insight. Do you get up early? Do you have a morning routine? Do you, what do you I, eat? Do you yeah, exercise? Look, I, I typically get up, I typically get up around 6 a.m. Uh, just because, you know, I'm an early riser, not because I'm particularly well disciplined. And then it's into the pool to wake up, and then it's into the espresso machine. I have a bunch of espresso machines. I'm a espresso obsessed tragic. I have a coffee <laughs> roastery, so I could be roasting some beans. Um, and then up, you know, tennis, we have a tennis court here. So I, I play a lot of tennis and there's a lake. So I walk around the lake with the dogs and yeah, that's, that fills the, and honestly, by the time Monday afternoon comes around, I can't wait to get back to work. And I, I, <laughs> I like that. I like to want to go to work mm -hmm. because I've had enough time off and my mind needs a challenge now. So, and Tom, we, you know, we have grandchildren coming to visit and they play on the front lawn and chase ducks around the pond and, Use the guest house. So, you know, on the weekends, often we've got one family or another with the grandkids here. Um, so, and my wife loves that. I mean, I'm always really happy to see them come, but I'm really happy to see them go again. <laughs> hey, do you know, do you know why uh, grandchildren get along so well with grandparents? Why do they? Because they have a common enemy. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that used to be me stuck in the middle of that sandwich. But um, yeah, no, it's it's a delight to have them here, and uh, you know we've got we've got the space for them to run around like lunatics, and so so they do, they do. So you Lots good at tennis? Or are you are you aware of my site, fatsotennis dot com? I no, I'm not. Yeah, um, yeah. I have the I have the dubious distinction of being the largest person ever to have created and starred in a tennis training video. <laughs> you can see that fantastic yeah, you can see the trail i'll have to check that out yeah you can see the trailer at the fatso tennis.com where i'm playing tennis and eating pizza at the same time <laughs> <laughs> that is, that is probably the best combination in the world that i've ever heard playing tennis and eating pizza it's almost as good as making love and eating burgers at the same time <laughs> yeah so uh yeah we uh, i created a uh, two dvd set and uh, some of it is hysterical and some of it is that just is just so fun. Is just uh, is real about how the angles of the court and everything, how I run the young people to death before I drop dead. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, well, you and I are two pieces from the same pod because that's you know I'm I'm 67 years old and our kids come up and they're in the early 30s typically and and um, yeah they still can't beat me so I I just like you side to side yeah uh, you know shorter angle halfway up the court. And and the greatest joy I, I have is not hitting the flat winner, you know, like a like a Roger Federer right. shot. It's just having them run, having them run, having them run, and eventually they. Just, yeah. I'm just anyway. That's just my super ego, uh, you know, <laughs> control trip there. But it's I got to say it's still fun. Oh yeah, and and yeah. I got uh, the first part is all these gadgets for fat people. And so if you can picture, so you know, the, the butt of your tennis racket and there's a suction cup you can put on there. So you never have to bend over to pick the ball up. You just push it down. <laughs> <laughs> and then, oh, I got to look at this. And then when I, if I play at a public court, I always play in the middle court. I don't want to be near the fences on the sides because if I'm sucking air, I go to pick the ball up and I accidentally kick it on purpose <laughs> and it goes clear to the fence and I can suck air while I'm walking gen gently to go get the ball. <laughs> oh, that's just so funny. Yeah. Fatsotennis.com. So, Fatsotennis.com. Yeah. Um, I, I'm there and I'm going to do the I might, I, we've got a pizza oven, so I might even do a pizza and, and, and eat the pizza while I watch you. Well, uh, you know what? I think I'll, I'll send you, I'll get Mark to, uh, I mean, they're DVDs. I think he has them digitized. I'll, I'll send you the, the files if you want to watch them. That'd be them. fantastic. Yeah. I'll, I'll show the kids. So uh, how do people get a hold of you? Look, a couple of ways. First of all, um, I do try to respond to all emails. So Tom at leadsology.guru. Tom at Leadsology, L-E-A-D-S-O-L-O-G-Y, like psychology, except for leads for marketing, Tom at leadsology.guru. Um, but if they want some piece of content, which could really mm -hmm. help them, the most prescriptive book I ever wrote, step-by-step -step on how to use OPN, how to use webinars, people can get a free copy of that at gettomsfreebook.com. And 
when they download the book, they'll also have the opportunity to come along to one of our webinars and just sit sit in the grandstand and see how, see how I run them. Yeah, and and I got to tell you, folks, that what's the name of the the webinar book I've got today on Kindle? Uh, uh, marketing, it's mark, with marketing with webinars. Yeah, so marketing with webinars get, get new clients one hour per month. Yeah, so if you're really interested, I mean, I have my method, but if you're, it's not as detailed as Tom's. I'll tell you that. Uh, you, you it really goes into the nitty gritty of the psychology of stuff and and titling and uh, and the uh, the value of it and oh it's just uh, it's a it's a really great great book I have one on um, how to get more people to attend your webinars and so uh, and uh, one interesting thing is uh, uh, I've had really great luck on show ups with sending one email the day of. And I've seen some of yours where you were sending a week in advance. So tell us about the difference there. It's changing, you know. When I when I started doing webinars, which I think it was two thousand and eight, we, we we would send the first email two weeks before. Um, now we send them five days before and two days before. But because our partners are sending the emails, you know, they have sometimes oh, have yeah, constraints where they send yeah. them. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so, so just doing but, my own, yeah. but a recommendation for them is is five days before and two days before. Mm -hmm. uh, once they've registered, we have you know we have reminders that go out. Um, we 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 my my business manager is a data scientist by profession, so he crunches the numbers, and we've done a lot of a lot of uh, testing and refining in terms of how many emails is optimum, uh, and it's it changes. You know, it can change probably every two years. We're sending a different number out at a different time on a different day. We have figured out the sweet spot of the time for running a webinar, which is 4 p.m. Wednesdays Eastern. Mm -hmm. um, and bear in mind, we have a global audience. So I'm here in Australia, um, 4 p.m. right now. Uh, you guys are not on day saving at time of recording. So that's 7 a.m. mine uh, the next day. So that's a reasonable time for me to be up presenting a webinar. 4 p.m. New York, 1 p.m. Uh, L.A., and I think about 10 p.m. in Europe, Western Europe. So yeah, it's kind of it's kind of the sweet spot for us. Yeah, people, people have to test. I mean, because uh, you know I have had great luck on Sunday nights sending one email. Wow. Sunday morning, uh, because remember wow. I'm only it's, my, it's just my list, so I I can't send yeah. you know tell twelve emails uh, promoting one uh, webinar. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, and it's a big list, but yeah. that's very interesting Sunday night because it's it's a it's a commercial product, it's a business product, right? Yeah, and uh, well, uh, various ones, but uh, but I get okay. enormous. I get seventy plus percent show ups uh, with one that's email, amazing. and so uh, yeah, that is amazing. And almost all of mine have been evening uh, webinars because a lot of my list are you know they're still at the dreaded job, so they can do stuff in the evening, right? So, yeah. So, and what what time Sunday do you run them? Uh, uh, and it depends on the, uh, uh, if it's daylight savings time or not, if it's in the summer, it's 9 PM. So it's already dark. If right. it's in the, no, excuse me. Uh, in the, in the winter it's yeah. In the winter it's 8 PM because it's dark. You know, it's been dark for hours, but in the summer yeah, people summer are outside. Does. So I would go, I go to 9 PM. Yeah. And still, yeah, gotcha. So it's, it's, it's after, after dinner, kids are in bed. Yeah um yeah hopefully yeah. there's nothing too compelling on netflix yeah that's very interesting yeah so i mean like i said it's every it's uh everybody has to test that's the whole thing uh, no no one person right. can tell you what's what's right if they do and eh, you better watch you guard your wallet and run you know you have you, yeah. you have to uh, stick in yeah. there and see what works for you with your offer and your audience and your people and so forth so uh right. if you were sports stuff you might be might be friday night or you know, for Saturday college games and, and Sunday pro games. I mean, it just depends on the topic and everything, too. All right. Well, mm -hmm. thanks so much for coming on, Tom. It's been a blast. Uh, uh, really appreciate it. You got some cool stuff going down on there uh, in uh, in Australia. And uh, I want to re uh, I want to say those things again. De get Tom's plural free book dot com will lead you to a free download and also uh, you'll see how to get on uh, one of his webinars to see the real thing in action and email tom at leadsology.guru. Thanks so much, Perfect. man. And privilege being here. Thanks for the invite, Tom. Okie dokie. We'll catch everybody on the next episode. See you later.